First Parish Church in beautiful Manchester-by-the-Sea, Massachusetts, on this beautiful Sunday, May morning, the sixth Sunday in the season of Easter. We welcome you here to this spiritual community where no matter who you are or where you are on your life or spiritual journey, you are fully welcome. I am Reverend Dr. Mark Boyer, the minister here at First Parish Church, and I welcome you on behalf of our worship team of Dr. Herman Weiss, Rebecca Shrimpton, Paul Knox, Richard Smith, and Cindy Boyer. We would love to know that you are here with us today, so please uh, do that if you can, and also please uh, let us know how we can reach you. Give us an email address or other contact information so that we can uh, put you on our mailing list, you can receive our newsletter, or you can find out about the many opportunities for spiritual growth that would be available for you to participate in, either live or online during this time. So now with that, let us prepare our hearts and minds and bodies and spirits to worship together as a community of God's people by singing the hymn, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. I invite you to now join me in our opening prayer, which is printed in your online bulletin. Holy One, you ask for our hands to do your work. Help us give them and not give up, because the work is hard. You ask for our voices to speak words of compassion, forgiveness, and justice. Help us give them and not hold back because we think our words won't matter. You ask for our eyes to notice the pain of others. Help us give them instead of closing them tight, because we fear what we might see. 
You ask for our lives so we might be made whole. Help us give them instead of settling for less than you created us to be. O oh God, help us to give you our hands, voices, eyes, and our entire being this and every day instead of only when it is convenient, safe, and easy. Renew us, send us, use us to make a difference as we now use our voices to say to you the words our brother, teacher, and leader Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
We've been asked to hold in our prayers this morning Judith Drinkwater's four-year-old grandson, Bennett. Uh, Bennett has been hospitalized in Boston Children's Hospital for the last week with a high fever. Uh, however, uh, he has tested negative uh, for any signs of COVID. Also ask you to continue to hold in your thoughts and prayers uh, all health care workers, particularly those doctors and nurses and aides who uh, are directly involved in terms of attempting to alleviate the effects of the pandemic. And also ask you to keep in your thoughts and prayers the fact that this month is National Mental Health Month. And that has certainly been uh, something else exacerbated uh, by this pandemic, the emotional and mental stress on so many people individually and in their relationships. So let us hold all of that in our thoughts and prayers. And along with those, I now invite you to add any other additional joys, concerns, prayer intentions that you wish to. Share them with those who you are with, uh, or if you are alone, simply share them in the silence of your hearts and let us bring all of that before our God at this time. I invite you to join me in prayer. God of this day and all days, God of this time and all times, God of this place and all places, we've come together this morning so we can listen and pray and sing and share, so we can help each other come a little closer to you and to how you call us to live because we don't always get it right. We don't always do or say the right thing at the right time the way that you need us to. And sometimes we know, but we just don't have the strength or the will to do it. And so we are grateful to you, O oh God, so grateful that you are a God of second chances that you offer us possibility and opportunity to grow and to change, to be and do better. The opportunity and possibility to get things right before they go wrong for ourselves and others, but also the opportunity for a second chance after they have gone wrong. And so we ask you to help us Help us to recognize and accept those second chances that you give us and use them well. Knowing that we do not have to be perfect. That in many times, in many ways, all that you ask from us is to be good enough. To give the best that we have, that we're capable of, in the time and place and under the circumstances that we are faced. Help us to be more willing to offer second chances, to offer that perspective of good enough to others, especially those we dislike or disagree with. Help us to answer your call when we would rather not, because you are willing, always willing, to give us second chances willing to do your best for us. Amen.
let us share these words from John's gospel. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. But again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, then take care of my sheep. The third time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to Peter, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the Last Supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. Jesus only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? He never met a question he didn't like. Jesus never met a question he didn't like. To ask, that is, not to answer. Because according to the longtime minister and seminary president and author Martin Copenhaver, over the course of the four Gospels, Jesus is asked approximately 180 questions. Out of those 180 questions, he directly answers all of three. But at the same time, over the course of those four Gospels, Jesus asks about 300 questions. Never met a question he didn't like. And in fact, seems as if there were some questions that Jesus absolutely loved. Like the one that he asks Peter three times in a row during the same conversation. By the time we reach the start of the 21st chapter in John's Gospel, Jesus has already appeared to all of the disciples, all of his closest followers, during that first Easter event. He has also already given them the Holy Spirit, already told them that it's now time for them to go out and carry on his message, his vision, his mission in the world. And so many scholars consider the 21st chapter to be uh, a later add-on, a sort of epilogue an epilogue that, in a sense, looks to address some unfinished business. One piece of unfinished business, uh, kind of churchy business, that's relevant to the time that John's Gospel was written. The other 
a little bit more spiritual business related to the time of Jesus' death and resurrection. The churchy business part has to do with the situation in the early Christian church about 80 years or so after Jesus' death, the time again during which John's gospel was written. And at that time, there had come to be a bit of a rivalry, let's put it that way. A rivalry between uh, those members of the Christian community who were uh, descended from Peter's leadership and those who were descended from the leadership of the character in John's gospel that we only know as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Scholars uh, use shorthand, refer to this character as the beloved disciple. An unnamed character, but an unnamed character who figures enormously prominently throughout John's gospel. The beloved disciple is presented as an ideal, the ideal disciple always says and does the right thing, always fully committed to Jesus. The beloved disciple is the, uh, is the only male disciple who we're told is at the cross with the women who were there when Jesus died. The beloved disciple is the one that Jesus puts the care of his mother Mary into the hands of after Jesus' death. And by the time John's Gospel was written, there was, a, again, this friendly rivalry. So part of what chapter 21 is meant to do as an epilogue is sort of resolve that. It's what that, all that stuff about, you know, Peter turning and, you know, Lord, what about him? And, you know, Jesus saying, well, if he should stay alive, you know, what's that to you? You do what you're supposed to do. Essentially, the, the take-home message of the resolution of the rivalry is that, the overall leadership of those descended from Peter is established. It, it is accepted. But at the same time, so is the autonomy of the community descended from that beloved disciple. So that's the churchy, uh, the churchy unfinished business. The more spiritual relationship-based unfinished business has to do with the relationship between Jesus and Peter. As the 21st chapter begins, Jesus appears to a group of disciples. He is standing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee while they are out fishing uh, out on the lake. When they recognize that it's Jesus on the shore, they bring the boat in, everybody comes in, and, you know, God bless Jesus, he's made breakfast for them. After they eat, they do the dishes. Jesus turns to Peter and says, got a minute? Peter cringes. Cringes. Because this will be the first time since Jesus' death that they will have come face to face alone, one on one first time since, well, you know, that night, the night before Jesus' death, when Peter denies being one of Jesus' followers three times in a row, denies him even to the point of claiming that he doesn't even know who Jesus is. Peter is understandably nervous, and then he cringes again when Jesus begins. Simon, son of John. Yikes. Jesus is using Peter's first name. The name Peter had when Jesus first met him, before Jesus changes it to Cephas, the Greek name, which translates in English as Peter and means rock. Jesus is using Peter's birth name. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever one of my parents used my full birth name, I got nervous. Whenever I heard Mark James Boyer, 
I knew that it was probably not a good thing. Simon, son of John, Peter says, Jesus says, do you love me more than these? More than these what? Jesus doesn't say, and neither does the writer of John's gospel. A different translation of this scene has Jesus saying, do you love me more than these things? The implication being that Jesus is referring perhaps to uh, Peter's fishing boat and fishing nets, the tools of his trade, the things in which uh, he used to make a living. But then another translation, a different one, uh, has Jesus saying, do you love me more than they do? The implication that Jesus is talking about whether Peter loves Jesus more than the other disciples do. What are these things? We don't know. We don't know for sure. And maybe it's better that. Maybe it's better that way, because then the implication is that Jesus is asking if not just Peter, but we love him more than whatever. Love him in the sense, that higher sense of Christian love, unconditionally. Love as commitment, devotion to. Do we love him more than whatever? Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter answers, well, yeah. Yeah, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. Peter figures, nailed it. Then Jesus asks him again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Skips the these things that time, but it's basically the same question. Simon, do you love me? Now Peter's a little confused. All right, didn't, you didn't get it the first time? You know, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus again says, as he does after Peter responds the first time, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, all phrases which symbolize take care of my people, take care of God's people. Now Peter figures, okay, I, I think we've got it this time. But then Jesus comes back a third time. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now Peter has gone from worry to confused to hurt. I mean, really, Jesus? You know me better than anybody. You know me inside and out. You know that I love you. Okay, Jesus says, then take care of my people. Take care of God's people. Again, we know that Jesus never met a question he didn't like, but he seemed to really like that question. Seemed to even love that question. But why that question? Why the same question three times in a row to the same person in the same conversation? Well, part of what's going on has to do with that number three. That number three, that number three, one of those numbers in the Bible that almost always symbolizes wholeness, completeness. Jesus asks Peter, do you love me three times? Because Peter's three-time denial must be made whole through three times of recommitment. It is a way of symbolizing Jesus reestablishing the relationship with Peter, rehabilitating Peter as one of his followers, and reestablishing Peter's leadership in the early Christian community. But, but, as, as we discussed during Thursday's Bible study session devoted to this passage, how much does Peter really recommit? 
Because if you think about it, Peter's answer to Jesus' question, do you love me, each time is, seems a little off, maybe a little less than ideal. Because when the Jesus, who also in the gospel says, let your yes mean yes and your no mean no, asks Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, well, Lord, you know that I love you. That's not exactly a simple, direct, yes, I love you. Now, maybe that doesn't mean anything. Maybe it doesn't. But I invite you to try that at home. Because I know if my wife asked me, do you love me? And I said, well, you know that I love you. It would be a real learning experience. I am quite sure that I would learn, for instance, just how comfortable our couch is to sleep on at night. So there's that. And then there's also that word love. Because a number of scholars have pointed out that in this scene, there are at least two, definitely two, maybe three, but definitely two different uses of the Greek verb for love. One of the verbs that's used, which means, which refers to love, refers to what in the Christian spiritual tradition is the highest form of love, unconditional love. Full devotion to. The other one has more to do with liking. You know, like how we'll say, oh, I love pizza. We don't really love pizza, but you know, we're really saying that we like something a lot, some object or person. The first two times that Jesus asks Peter, do you love me, he is using the higher form. But Peter is responding with the lower form. Then the third time, they both use the lower form lower form. It almost seems as if Jesus is giving in or giving up. But maybe it's something different. Something a lot better. Maybe it is Jesus allowing good enough to be good enough. The Belgian relationship therapist, the renowned therapist Esther Perel, in a recent interview was asked about the strain that this time of pandemic is putting on relationships all around the world. And one of the things she said is that in general in relationships, but especially in a time like this, we have a tendency to highlight the negative and take the positive for granted when it comes to our relationships. But Jesus doesn't do that here. Jesus does the exact opposite. He highlights what is less than ideal. He accepts the less than ideal response the less than ideal thing that Peter is offering him in that time, in that set of circumstances. And just putting aside the negative, the fact that it is not necessarily what Jesus wanted, ideally. He reestablishes the relationship with Jesus, rehabilitates the relationship, based not on the fact that Peter gives him the ideal, but that Jesus is willing to accept that Peter, you know, what Peter is giving him as good enough. Good enough for now. What about us? 
What about us? Hey, it's no secret. Again, relationships are being strained all over the world because of this. Spouses and partners are getting more easily annoyed with each other and probably more easily annoyed about things that they normally wouldn't be annoyed over. Parents and children are getting more annoyed with each other than usual and probably more annoyed over things they normally wouldn't be annoyed about. Neighbors, siblings, it's happening. And it's natural in a situation like this. But that also means that it might be a good time for us to all get a little bit better at letting good enough be good enough. Let go of of any idea that the other person has has to be ideal. They have to be and do and say what we want them to. That they always have to answer our questions in the ideal way. Maybe now is a good time for us to be a little better at letting good enough be good enough. And not just for others. Not just for those we have a relationship with, but for ourselves too. Maybe this is a really good time to do a little bit better at letting go of this idea of some perfect ideal existence that we are supposed to have, the ideal of perfection that our culture is so constantly trying to sell us on. And instead, let good enough be good enough. Especially because we have no idea where this is going. We have no idea where we're going to end up through all of this except that we have a pretty good idea that things are going to be different. And there may be many things that are going to be less than ideal. We don't have any control over that, or at least not a whole lot. But what we do have control over is that we can choose to let good enough be good. So let me end with a confession. I really don't like that character of the beloved disciple. (laughs) I really don't like that character. They are way too perfect, way too ideal. They just don't seem real to me. But maybe, maybe that's why they don't have a name because they're not real, because they're not. But Peter, I love Peter. Love in that higher sense, that unconditional relationship. I get Peter. I relate to Peter. He says and does the wrong thing at the wrong time a lot of the time. He messes up constantly. I get that. But he's the real deal to me. And we know. We know because Jesus calls on him to lead, to take care of of his people, God's people. Even though he is less than ideal, even though he's less than ideal in that moment when Jesus is trying to rehabilitate their relationship. What Peter has to offer in that time and place is good enough for Jesus. It's good enough for God. And so are we. And there's no question about that. Amen.
On behalf of our worship team, I'd like to thank you for being with us this morning to share in our community's weekly time of understanding and remembering God's presence and power and goodness and challenge and call for our lives. For those of you who are part of the FPC community, I hope that you'll stay for a while and join in our virtual friendship time immediately after this blessing. Uh, for those of you who are not, again, we'd love to hear from you. Let us know also how we might be able to serve you in some way during this less than ideal time. So now, my friends, it is time for us to leave this sacred space and go out into the world ready and willing to commit ourselves to the life, the way that Jesus lived and calls us to but also willing to recognize and accept the fact that Jesus is not looking for the ideal. He is not looking for us to be perfect. Neither is the God that Jesus embodies. The God that Jesus embodies is more than willing to accept that the best that we have during the time and place and the circumstances that we are in is good enough. We are the people of a God who is willing to let our good enough be good enough. And for that, we say thanks be to God.